Welcome to our online lecture on the bluest eye. This is uh, necessarily, due to our format, going to have to be probably far more uh, brief than what the novel deserves, but there's only so much you can talk about in a limited venue like this. Um, my hope is that you'll give the novel deeper consideration than I'm able to do with this, but at the same time, um, do some considerable thought about what I think are some of the most salient points about the novel. I want to begin with, um, and you can look up about uh, uh, Toni Morrison all you want to. There's just reams of things out there on her. Um, I consider her to be one of the greatest novelists of the 20th century, certainly in the United States, if not worldwide. Um, I, one of the things that people frequently overlook is, you know, what the author has to say about the work. Uh, I don't know why that is, but frequently they either will overlook it or sometimes to the opposite extreme, give too much credibility to it. And I want you to look at the foreword because she does say some things here that I think are very important. Um, she says basically, you know, one of the things that the novel is going to be dealing with is the tragic and disabling consequences of accepting rejection as legitimate as self-evident. She says, I knew that some victims of powerful self-loathing turn out to be dangerous, violent, reproducing the enemy who has humiliated them over and over again. Um, you'll see characters who are of that of that sort. Uh, others surrender their identity, uh, melt into a structure that delivers the strong person they lack. Um, most others, however, grow beyond it. But there are some who collapse silently, anonymously, with no voice to express or acknowledge it. They are invisible. And certainly as the novel goes on, you get the distinct impression that Morrison's writing it for that latter, this novel for that latter group, the ones that are forgotten, like Pecola. Later in the foreword, she says, the damaging internalization of assumptions of immutable inferiority. Immutable means unchanging. Um, originating in an outside gaze. I focus, therefore, on how something as grotesque as the demonization of an entire race could take root inside the most delicate member of society. What does that do to the most fragile, most vulnerable person, basically? A child, she says. The most vulnerable member, a female. In trying to dramatize the devastation that even casual racial contempt can cause, I chose a unique situation, not a representative one. And now that's that's an important acknowledgement there. You know, you come to terms with what you think she means by that. But she says, I chose a unique representation, um, not a, rep a unique example, not not a representative one. In other words, this isn't something that happens to everyone. It's I, I was choosing this particular case to talk about it in the extreme um, because I wanted to show what an extreme manif manifestation of this is. Um, and so we get we get an indication early on, and if you've completed the novel, you can see what she's getting at here is what does what does a society that that takes a takes a look at one particular classification of people and demonizes them, uh, marginalizes them, um, humiliates them, uh, ostracizes them, makes them something out of the mainstream, makes them something out of the norm. What does that do? And, and I don't think she's just talking about African Americans in the United States. I think she's talking about something much more universal than that. What, how does that, what does that do to a person? And especially what is the, you know, what, what in the most extreme case does that do to the most vulnerable type of person? And so that's what we're being presented with, I think, in the novel, among many other things. Um, she starts off, most of you are probably too young to remember Dick and Jane books. Maybe you've come across them before, but when I was growing up, um, uh, certainly in the 19... 60s as a as a as an elementary school child in the 70s you would get the Dick and Jane books they were early readers that children would use and one of the things that you um, notice about them immediately today is that everybody in the book is white and they all live this ideal um, lifestyle where everybody's happy and nothing really bad happens nothing seriously bad happens and they live in clean little neighborhoods that are crime free and everything's kind of this idyllic thing and it, 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 if you were not white in the 1950s and 60s and use these as readers, I can only imagine what that might have felt like. Um, well, okay, so whiteness isn't the norm. Um, uh, Judeo-Christian uh, upbringing, uh, certainly uh, Protestant, whatever, uh, middle class, that's the norm. And if you're something other than that, you're on the outside looking in. And what does that mean for you? What does that do to your self-concept? Um, so it's no coincidence that she begins each chapter with this kind of Dick and Jane kind of um, prose, 
um, and, uh, and 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 you kind of you, you've got to kind of figure out what impact that has on you as the reader. I think it has a lot of impact on readers. Uh, here is the house. It is green and white. It has a red door. It is very pretty. Here is the family: mother, father, Dick, and Jane live in the green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane. She has a red dress. She wants to play, etc., etc., etc. This stands in really stark contrast to the very dysfunctional home lives of many of our characters in this novel, who happen to be African. American. Um, the other question is why tell it from Claudia's perspective? I think Claudia is kind of an every person um, and she's obviously later in life she's looking back upon this experience in her childhood so it gives her the it gives us the double perspective of a child's immediate response but an adult's ability to reflect. Um, and then we hear a lot of other voices too. We get an opportunity to hear soliloquies even from Pecola herself. Uh, towards the end, even though she's descended into into madness at that point. So, you know, be, be on the lookout for voices and why use those voices and why hear from those uh, individuals. Some of the themes that you want to be uh, looking for here, obviously alienation, you know, and not just individual alienation because you get alienation. F uh, Pecola is alienated. Uh, Charlie is, is, is alienated. Uh, um, Pauline is, is alienated. Yes, all of those folks. But an entire class of people is alienated. Uh, and told you're not part of the mainstream culture of the country you actually live in. Consider for a moment, and 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 even if you are uh, a member of a group that has historically been marginalized or or in some sense alienated, it's still really hard for us to look back two, three, four generations at what our uh, grandparents and great grandparents went through with respect to that. The sense of alienation on th that they went through had to have been just truly profound. To be a person who was born and lived in this country her or his entire life, whose whose parents and grandparents and great grandparents did, but not to be considered a full participant of that society. And all the visual cues, not just the legal things like segregation or Jim Crow laws or whatever, all the all the visual cues that you get, um, that the 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 ideals of success are mainstream Protestant white, um, that the um, that that the movie stars and the 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 heroes in books and the uh, um, you know the popular music and these kinds of things all of those kinds of things in in, in magazines especially with little girls um, the ideals of beauty and of course this novel in particular hones in on that very very um, uh, early on that that the standards of beauty something we still argue about today you know what how do how do visual standards uh, visual um, images uh, to young girls, how does that affect them and their self uh, um, esteem and, and those kinds of things? So, so alienation isn't. Don't just limit this to to, to racial alienation. It, it's it's alienation on a lot of different levels, but certainly the novel is dealing with it. The question of freedom and how does one. How does one acquire freedom? We see this certainly with Geraldine and with um, other um, uh, young uh, Christian African American women that are presented to us in a couple of those chapters there, where the where where Claudia tells us all about them. Uh, they're trying to achieve a measure of freedom uh, with their property, with their lifestyles, with their domestic world, etc. But you have to ask the question of whether or not that is actually freedom. Um, uh, and then, of course, what she's alluding to in the foreword here, this racial constructs and self-loathing. And I think that's the one thing that, 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 you know, it's not a novel just about racism. It's about, in some ways, what a society structured the way it was does to your perception of yourself if you are a member of that alienated group, right? Um, and, and, and that's, I think, what she's getting at in the foreword, if I read her right. And it, the, uh, the idea that it, it, is it, it isn't just the unfairness, it's not just the injustice, it's not just the cruelty, it's not just that. It's what it does to your own self-image and who you think you are, that corrosive effect. You know, am I not good enough? Am I not worthy? Am I not what I should be? Um, 
through no fault of my own, but but that that it, it takes its toll on the person's self-image. And that's, I think, one of the things that it gets at. We'll see that in just a moment. And then, then of course, I think one of the things that's kind of overlooked because it's overshadowed by some of these bigger themes is the very important theme of the impact of time and place on our lives. That, I think, has not gotten enough t- attention in the novel because when Claudia is looking back, and remember the novel is Claudia as an adult looking back on her youth and what that time and that place did to form who she was. We don't get to see much of her as an adult, but we hear the voice of an adult reliving this through the eyes of her own childhood. And that allows you to have perspective. Uh, and we get to see her perspective, that is. And that's an important theme as well. What does What do we do in later in life with the experiences we had when we were younger? And how did the time and the place of our development impact who we are as an individual. Okay, so so all those things are very, very important. What I want to do is I want to kind of dive into the breed loves themselves and that family because they're the central family here. The McTeers are kind of watching from outside in some ways. We get to know the girls, uh, the McTeer girls, but they're not the central focus of the story, obviously. Um, in some cases, they're just kind of sounding boards or witnesses, um, though there is considerable interaction. I think that's been underestimated, as I said. So so obviously, Charlie Breed, Breedlove is one of the most important characters in, in the piece, partly because he is, I'm skipping to the last bulleted item there, it's really difficult to ask what kind of figure he is and how we should perceive him. He does some very, very horrible things. Um, raping his own daughter, he's clearly murdered people, he says so. Um, and it, so all of those things make you think, how in the world could I ever see this person as a sympathetic figure? And yet, we are also told impact of time and place on our lives. We're told a lot about his background. Um, the fact that he was abandoned as a child, the humiliation scene. Um, there's just almost nothing more humiliating to a young man than to be degraded in front of some girl that he's fond of by other men. And it was a humiliating act. And he took it out on the girl. He takes it out on the girl. Why? Because he's incapable of being able to fight back against the white men who humiliated him. You say, well, he could have. Well, it, was a, it would have been a death sentence, sure. So, you know, what we do as human beings sometimes is, is it's called misplaced aggression. We take it out on people that we can take it out on rather than maybe the people that we should take it out on. And, and is that a bad thing? Okay. There's an ethical component there. Yeah, you shouldn't. But at the same time, it's what people do and you shouldn't be surprised that they do it. Um, And in fact, he does that even in the rape of his own child. Um, He's not sexually attracted to her. He is in fact, as the novel states and as the passages state, repulsed by her, but more importantly, repulsed by his own inability to do anything about making her better. Um, In a way, his sexual assault of her is, in an odd sort of way, something that he is doing to himself. Um, Not physically, but psychologically. He is a failure, he feels, as a man, he, all the way back to his humiliation in the woods. He has not been able to make anything of himself. He has been um, you know, abused and ridiculed by society since he was a small boy. He has never been loved. And now he's a father and doesn't know how to be one because he hasn't had one. And he looks at this child who is, by some people's standards, unattractive, and kind of quiet and not terribly bright, and he hates the fact that he's now produced a daughter who is equally as much of a failure, he thinks. Um, there's a, he, he sees her as pathetic, and, and he because of that, he doesn't like her. Be, he doesn't like her because he doesn't like the fact that he can't do anything to make her life better. And so he just abuses her. It's a really, it's, this is a deep, deep psychological novel here. The the characters are dealing with some serious, um, you know, psychological issues. And Morrison does a superb job of sort of probing into that and saying, why do people 
impact of time and place on our lives. Why do people turn out the way they turn out? Why do they do the things they do? Um, you know, the, the episode in which he is seeking his father and he finds his father and his father basically says, I want nothing to do with you. Who are you? Get away from me. Um, and he soils himself. He, 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 he essentially goes into shock um, because that is not the outcome he had played over and over in his mind would happen. His father would say, oh, it's good to see you. Oh, I've missed you. Or, oh, well, at the very least, sort of shake his hand and say, well, I'm glad we finally connect. So he did not expect to be completely rejected like that and was unprepared for it, psychologically unprepared for it. Um, so after having been abandoned and then looking for the father, the father rejects him. You know, he then turns, of course, obviously to a life of crime and violence and these kinds of things. That's another thing she's alluding to in the in the forward there. So when you look at Charlie and 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 what happened to him as as a child, you can't point to that and say, well, that excuses everything he did. Um, if that were the case, it would be a really easy novel and life would be a simple thing, right? I mean, that that it, it, you know, it would be very easy for juries in criminal trials to to say you know, um, oh, well, something bad happened to him, so not guilty. No, it doesn't work that way, right? But at the same time, you can't ignore that, what happened to him, in trying at least, if not to apologize for or, or, or excuse, at least to explain how what he did later in life, um, how that came about. Um, and But we're still left with the very difficult question of wrestling and saying, to what extent is he responsible? Clearly, he's responsible for his acts. But we have to also take into account the mitigating circumstance that the guy really just had. You know, what do you do in a society that doesn't give a person a break? What do you do in a society where, you know, people are essentially from birth told you're not worthy of anything? And that's a really difficult thing. Um, the same thing with uh, Pauline, who goes by the name Polly with her white family that she works for. It's a really twisted kind of thing. It's a twisted kind of escapism that she lives in. She, of course, you know, early on we're told that her relationship with Charlie started off well, but then all of a sudden he became you know, um, abusive and, and rejected her, but she stays married to him partly because she enjoys berating him. Uh, the worst thing that could ever happen to her would if, would be if Charlie woke up one day and said, you're right. I haven't been living right. I'm going to give up alcohol. I'm going to be a much more caring, loving father, and I'm going to get a good job and I'm going to do my best to support my family. She would be in torture because she loves the, the ability to berate him and verbally abuse him and fight with him. She, she likes that. Um, she sees herself as Jesus's executioner and prison guard. And it, it, it's, it's a sick, twisted relationship, obviously, but it's even more twisted in some respects that she works for the white family that she does. And there, it's kind of like, she feels when she goes to the movies and sees these these white actors and actresses living these glamorous lifestyles, and she can be sort of in a fantasy world. And the world that she has with this white family is different from her real family. It's really it's a really odd thing, isn't it? Where she has her own nickname. She didn't have a nickname when she was a kid. No one bothered to give her a nickname. That's the thing. that If you've got a nickname, you know somebody at least noticed you. Um, but if you have no nickname, no one ever noticed you. No one ever, you know, bothered to, to get to know you well enough to ascribe something to, or to, to assign something to your personality. You know, even if you're, even if your nickname is stinky, at least someone noticed that you smelled bad, right? But, um, with Polly, she has her own sort of make-believe family. She can pretend like she's like she's part of them, but really we know she's not. And why? Because of race. We know that that white family will never really accept her as one of their own, and she can go on pretending as though she has. She has a clean, neat white uh, family that that, and she's got these this perfect little life from eight to five, and 
She even feeds them better than her own family. This self-loathing thing. I, I hate my life. I'm a disaster. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I'm from a rejected group of people. But at least I can sort of vicariously live through these other really clean, neat, white people. Um, it's just a sick thing, right? And that's, again, that's what I think Morrison's trying to explore in this novel is what does it do to an individual? And then, of course, by extension, an entire people to, to, to raise them with the belief that they're unworthy, to raise them with the belief that they do, are not entitled, that they are somehow less, you know, and even in, in, in with respect to the title, to, to ascribe certain characteristics as being the ideal beauty characteristics. What does that do to a little girl who doesn't have that? Right. Um, in our in our second video here, we'll discuss uh, some some more characters and um, and and get into a little bit more about some of the major scenes and episodes.